Hey friends, I'm really excited. Tonight, I'm going to read you an excerpt of the book that I'm writing, and this piece is called Back from the Dead. A little background on this, often I'm getting asked about what was it that caused me to change my life and go on a journey where I lost over half my body weight. And for those of you who know my story, I mentioned that it was the death of my father that caused me to rethink things and and really dedicate my life to to health well here it is the background story behind it back from the dead michael you want to take a ride to the convenience store my dad asked sure let's go for a ride he called to his car companions the pugs molly and rascal they both barked excitedly and raced to the front door. Dad grabbed his keys from the hangar by the door and we headed out to his car. He opened the driver's side door of his dark blue Crown Vic and let the pugs in. I got into the passenger side and ushered the pugs to the back seat. Dad got in, started the car, rolled down the windows. He lit a cigarette and we backed out the driveway. We took a right onto Route 32. He gunned the gas as we headed down the road. He was driving a little fast, but I still felt safe despite his weakened condition. I didn't care, as I was used to the way he drove. Hey, grab that CD down there, my dad said, motioning to the center console. I reached down and picked up a homemade CD with Ozzy written across the front. Where'd you get this, I asked. Ah, Brian made it for me. Pop it in the player, would you? I turned on the car stereo and inserted the CD into the slot. Dad took another puff of his cigarette. The music started. Flying High Again started playing, and I thought to myself how cool my dad was after all these years for a guy his age. He lived life the way he wanted, eating, drinking, and smoking, making his own rules, a life that soon would have a cost. As we rounded the corner at the bottom of the hill, he gunned the gas again, pinning me to the door slightly. Then my dad says, Yeah, this thing's got the same engine as your Mustang, you know? Yeah, I remember you telling me that. He gunned the gas again as we run, continued on to the store. In some ways, I envied some of my father's carefree spirit, despite some of the stress it would cause on our families at times. For the most part, my dad was a law-abiding, decent guy. He was also reckless at times in terms of how he took care of himself, smoking cigarettes, drinking alcohol excessively, and generally eating unhealthy foods. His poor health habits were taking its toll on him as we recently learned he had lung cancer from all the years of smoking. Now he'd already dealt with colon cancer having had a section of his colon removed and recovered from that. Now his condition was terminal. He was told he had six months to a year and a half to live depending on how the treatment takes to slow it down. He tried the treatment for a while but he didn't like the side effects so he stopped getting treatment altogether. He decided to leave it in God's hands. Over the next few months, my dad's health began to decline rapidly. He quickly became unable to care for himself and needed professional care. He eventually ended up in a nursing care facility to help him rehabilitate. The facility, located at 59 Harrington Court in Colchester, Connecticut, stood on the same location of the Harrington Convalescent Home that my grandfather once owned. There was something comforting in that for my dad. When I would visit him there, we would often talk about, he would often talk to me about needing to get better so he could get back home and help my mom around the house. He was in denial about his terminal condition. Maybe he just didn't want to face the reality. I know I didn't want to face it either, hoping that in some way his health would turn around. 
My 40th birthday came, and I was in no mood to celebrate as my dad's health was declining. The next month was my wife's birthday. We decided to have a party at my parents' house. My brother went to the nursing facility to pick up my dad and bring him back. When I got back, he helped dad up the cement steps outside and up the flight of steps just inside the doorway of their raised ranch house. Dad was visibly weak and he looked pale. Pat, you don't look well. Are you okay? My mom asked. I'm fine, he answered weakly. His voice was barely audible. Brian, did they say anything about him? He looks worse than he did yesterday. He was fine when he got into the car. My mom sighed and checked Dad's forehead. He needs to rest and sit down. She led him over to the couch, and then we started to prepare for Terry's birthday. Eventually, Dad regained some strength, and he headed down the hallway to his bedroom. My mom asked, where he, asked me where he was. I told her I saw him head down the hall. Mom headed down to the bedroom. She found him sitting on the bed looking at his die-cast car model collection. Pat, are you okay? He didn't answer. Pat, what are you doing? Are you coming out to Teresa's party? Yes, he replied in a weak voice. He laid back for a moment and closed his eyes. My mom looked around the bed. My dad had taken and laid some of his, the cars out from his model car collection all around the bed. Michael, can you come down and help your father? He needs help getting up from the bed, my mom called down to me. I headed down the hall into the bedroom. I saw my dad laying on his side. I reached out for his hand. Are you able to sweeten your feet around, I asked. Yeah, he answered. Michael, I have to check on the food, my mom said. Do you need Brian to help? No, I can manage. Gently, I guided my dad around so he was sitting upright on the bed and his legs were hanging down to the floor. He sat there for a moment. Okay, are you ready, I asked him. Yes, he replied. I reached out and grasped my dad's right hand. He got up to his feet. He was a little shaky. Dad, I'll help you down the hall. So I put his hand on my shoulder as we walked down the hallway to the living room. I walked with him back to the sofa and helped him sit down. We had the food and celebrated Terry's birthday. Dad didn't eat much, but he seemed to be interacting and enjoying the time with us. Soon it was time for him to head back to the nursing care facility to get his medications. Brian held his hand out to help Dad up from the couch. Dad got up slowly and stood there, his body shaking. He appeared to be too weak to stand. Mom, there's no way he's going to be able to get down the stairs, Brian said. We have to get him back soon. We don't have his medications here, my mom replied. Pat, you're not able to walk, are you? My mom asked. He didn't answer. He sat back down onto the couch. Brian, Michael, what are we going to do? I'll help him down, I said. I went over to my dad. Okay, Dad, I got you. I reached out my hand and helped him back up. I had him put his arm on my shoulder so we could walk to the stop, top of the staircase. In the meantime, my family made their way outside. My mom stayed in with me and Dad. Michael, he's not going to be able to get down those stairs. He's too weak, my mom said. I stood there a moment holding up to my dad and considering my options. I'll carry him then, I replied. Dad, I'm going to lift you up. Dad didn't respond. I got on his side and picked him up. I was a little surprised how light he felt. My dad had always been a thick, strong man. He stood about five foot ten. I steadied myself at the top of the stairs. Oh, Michael, be careful. You're going to strain your back, or both of you are going to get hurt, my mom said. Mom, I can do this, I responded. I started taking the first step down. Dad turned his head towards my ear and whispered, barely audible, 
Michael, no. Dad, we have no choice, I said. He didn't say anything. Slowly I made my way down the stairs, holding on to the man who once held me in his arms. I tried not to think about it, as I needed to focus on taking each stair slowly. My dad was one of the toughest, strongest men I ever knew. His feats of strength were legendary. I remember him lifting up the side of his Opal GT, having my brother and me slip wooden blocks underneath so he could work on it. His legs were tree trunks. His arms were thick and powerful. He was also one of the coolest dudes I knew. Many of my friends and my brother's friends enjoyed spending time with him. He was Superman and the Fonz all in one. But to see him reduced to this shell of a man now, who I now held in my arms was heartbreaking. It was hard for him to retain his dignity now that he was so weak and barely could walk and wearing a diaper. As I made my way down the stairs, I could see my family waiting outside for us, watching. My mom opened the front door and I carefully stepped outside. I could see Terry out in the driveway look, looking, wiping away the tears from her eyes. I made it down the cement stairway to the car as Brian helped me get Dad into the front seat and buckle him in. I saw my niece off in a distance watching with anguish on her red face as Terry hugged her for comfort. This was one of the most humbling experiences in my life. Over the next few months, I continued visiting my dad at the nursing care facility, making that drive down Harrington Court in my Mustang with the loud exhaust my dad loved to hear. His room was near the parking lot, and in some days I would rev up the engine just so he could hear it. He would often ask me if I came in the Mustang, as it made him happy that I liked muscle cars like he did. In many ways, I was just like my dad. Like him, I didn't have a good system for managing my stress. He smoked cigarettes his entire adult life and now was dealing with the results of that. He drank alcohol and ate poorly. I didn't smoke, but I did drink occasionally, and sometimes when I was stressed, I would drink too much. My primary comfort, however, was food. Through the years, I struggled with my weight, which was eventually affecting my health. I started to develop sleep apnea, high blood pressure, gastric reflux, and I was pre-diabetic. To make matters worse, I had lost my will to live. I felt helpless in my condition and so had no hope for ever being able to change. On many nights I went to bed, just wishing I would have a heart attack in my sleep. On one occasion I took a handful of sleeping pills with a bottle of vodka, went to bed just to see what would happen. I woke up the next day feeling worse about my life. My dad's condition continued to worsen. One night, my uncle came to visit him and performed a Reiki ritual to help ease some of his suffering. The next day, I took my day off from work to visit my dad. I headed to the nursing home and parked my car in the lot. I stepped out and saw my dad's best friend, Dave, getting out of his vehicle, so I approached him. Hey, how's it going, I asked. Doing okay, Mike. Just here to check on Pops, he replied. We walked into the facility together. As we approached my dad's room, I saw my great-aunt Eileen stepping out of his room. Her face lit up when she saw me. Michael, how are you holding up, she asked. I'm okay, about as good as can be expected, I replied. Oh, this is Dave. This is Dad's good friend. They shook hands and chatted briefly, and then Dave stepped inside my dad's room. I stayed out with my aunt. He's not looking too well, is he? I asked my aunt. She had been a nursing home administrator most of her career. No, it's in God's hands now. It's very sad to see him like this, she replied. She hugged me and gave me a kiss on the cheek. I love you, Michael. We'll get through this, she said. I said goodbye to my aunt and stepped into my dad's room. I saw my brother Brian on one side of dad's bed 
closest to the door. Dave was on the other side. Dad was awake, and the guys were talking to him. On my immediate left was a cart that hadn't been there in the room before. It had some pastries, coffee, and some water on it. It also had a box of tissues. Hey, Brian, how's it going? I said to my brother. I'm okay, he replied. What's this? I asked, motioning to the cart. I don't know. It was here when I got here this morning, he replied. I could see that my dad was lucid, but he wasn't really able to speak. He seemed to understand what Brian and Dave were saying. I approached the bed and hugged him. Hi, Dad. I could see in his eyes that he was happy to see me. He looked a little disoriented, and his color was pale. We all chatted a while. I stepped out to call my mom to see when she was coming. She said she was on her way. When I got back, I could see that my brother was upset. Michael, get the nurse. He's freaking out. Something's wrong, he said. I headed down the hall to the nurse's station and informed one of the nurses about my dad's condition. I walked back with her to dad's room. Brian stepped aside and let the nurse check my dad's vitals. After a few minutes, she turned to my brother and motioned us to step outside the room. He's dying, she said. What do you mean? Right now? I questioned in desperation. Yes, she replied softly and gave me a gentle hug. She told me and my brother that they were going to give us time with him, but to come and get the nurses if we need them. Brian and I headed back into the room. Dave was holding Dad's left hand. Brian went back to the other side on Dad's right, and I stood next to him. My brain was in a fog. Brian touched Dad's forehead. His eyes were still open, but he looked a little scared. Eventually, Dad began to sit up sharply with his eyes bulging out, his mouth open as Dave and Brian held onto his hands tightly. And then his eyes lost his glimmer as he laid back into the bed. I stepped back from the bed and gasped. My brother gently put his hand on Dad's chest, closed his eyes, and took a deep breath. I stepped into the bathroom and sucked back a gasp of tears. I'd only seen one other person in my life pass to death right before my eyes, and that was my Baba, my grandmother. When she passed, it was peaceful, like going to sleep. This was different. It was gruesome, as my dad struggled, almost as if he were fighting it. And the one thing I was convinced I saw in those eyes as he passed, regret. I don't think my dad nor the rest of us had truly accepted that this was the end for him. It was so surreal at times, thinking about all the events that led up to his death. And when it finally came, he realized it, and he was scared. That memory is forever burned in my mind. Brian asked me if I would stay in the room when Mom arrived, and I told him I would. He and Dave stepped out of the room. I headed over the bed and looked at my now lifeless father. He was just 63 years old. At the time, I was 40, and I weighed well over 400 pounds. I knew that my poor health condition, my life was a ticking time bomb. I was numb. After a short while, I could hear my mom talking to the nurse in the hallway. I could hear the rustling of Molly and Rascal's feet on the floor. She had brought them to visit Dad. The door was partway closed. Then I saw my mom open the door. Her mouth dropped. He died, she screamed. She dropped the leashes and the pug scurried into the room. She walked over to the bed. Pat, why? Why didn't you wait for me? She began to sob. I hugged my mom as she got into the bed with Dad. She held on to him sobbing and asking him why he didn't wait. This went on, and after a while, she had me get the pugs and put them on the bed with Dad. I picked them up 
And immediately they went to his face and began licking him. They know, Michael. They know. My mom said, sniffing back the tears. She asked me, what happened? I told her that dad didn't look well and how he was acting and what the nurse had told me. After some time, a nurse came back and asked if we needed anything and told us to take as much time as we needed with him. And I told my mom that he struggled as he died. She said she thinks it was a heart attack in the end. I told her we need to learn something from dad's poor health habits. I was not going to let his death be in vain. In the past, we'd begged him to take better care of himself. But in the end, we couldn't save him. I knew I had to save my own life. I no longer wanted to end it. Up until now, I had been dead inside. But on April 28th, 2010, my life changed forever. And I came back from the dead.